edge of a new frontier. That's why I've called this journey Voyage into AI, because I would compare it with space. Most AI talks about the technology. I'm here to talk to you about the humanity aspect. People talk about AI, but I think they should rephrase it AS, artificially stupid, because it's up to us to create the intelligence in the machine. I'm the storyteller from the future, and I come back to enable you to survive what is to come. At the moment, you're asking the wrong questions. You're talking about questions like security with driverless cars, with safety with driverless cars, but you should be talking about security. Oftentimes, this technology is created by systems, and they use these systems for oppression in the future. So in the future, when you call your Uber, and you're looking to go to your location, just maybe to see a friend, it's very important to check that you haven't got any outstanding warrants for your arrest because the Uber won't end up going to your destination, it'll be taking you to the nearest police station. So be very wary of the technology that's being created and how it's going to be used. I've created a project called Riot, which I'm here to tell you about today. Riot uses artificial intelligence, facial recognition, and, art and machine learning to navigate through a riot. Its objective is to enable you to navigate your own fear. Please understand this is not about empathy. I've got no interest in empathy. I've got an interest in empowering you and using media to empower you. My message is getting out there, but I'm here today to talk to you, my fellow voyagers and influencers at the cutting edge of your craft, because we need to get the message out there and we need to create a change. Before I talk to you about your future, I'm going to go back to the past because you need to get an understanding of your media and how your media is really mostly manipulating you. At the moment, you've kind of got the impression that it's not manipulating you, but it still is. So I'm going to take you back to the past so you get a context of your origins of media. Don't get nervous. As a part of the war effort, the US government set up a Committee on Public Information, and Bernays was employed to promote America's war aims in the press. The President, Woodrow Wilson, had announced that the United States would fight not to restore the old empires, but to bring democracy to all of Europe. And Bernays proved extremely skillful in promoting this idea, both at home and abroad. Wilson's reception in Paris astounded Bernays and the other American propagandists. They had made him a hero of the masses. And as he watched the crowd surge around Wilson, Bernays began to wonder whether it would be possible to do the same type of mass persuasion, but in peacetime. That if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace and propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans using it. So we found the word Council on Public Relations. Bernays was determined to find a way to manage and alter the way these new crowds thought and felt. To do this, he turned to the writings of his uncle Sigmund, and the picture of hidden irrational forces inside human beings fascinated him. He wondered whether he might make money by manipulating the unconscious. So now you have an idea of the origins of some of your media, we can move forward into the present. So here in the present, this is what happens when your media is manipulating you. When you kind of have almost invisible systems of oppression, the people start to rebel or demonstrate or riot on the global stage. Having seen this around the world, I wanted to create an experience which would put people in the center of one of these environments, as opposed to 
being told how to think or given a certain perspective by putting you in the middle of a story and then enabling your emotions to navigate through, I felt that would humanize very complex themes and enable people to return to these feelings of being able to trust their emotions. And that's when I came up with Riot. Riot is an emotionally responsive film that uses artificial intelligence and facial recognition to navigate through a riot. Basically, you watch the film and it responds in real time to your emotions. So if you respond to the film in fear, it will branch in one direction, and if you respond with anger, it responds in another. How it actually works is that it's a sensory storytelling experience. It starts off with an actor who's the riot cop who intimidates you before you even enter into the experience. As you move into the set design, you see the environment of a riot all spilled out around you, like unturned debris, a dustbin, the scent of smoke in the environment, haze is all around you. This is not a VR experience. This is a projection onto a screen. And the webcam watches you as you watch the film. I, didn't, I wanted to create an imperceptible interface. It's a very high-tech experience where the technology is responding to you, but I didn't want you to have any wearable technology at all. This is almost a, um, a reality simulator, a reality creator, that I wanted you to become aware of how your emotions affect the narrative of the film, that in the exact same way your emotions affect the narrative of your life. So I didn't want to put you in a world, I wanted to put the world around you. So that when you moved away from the experience, you would kind of interact with your own life in the exact same way. It's a very kind of neuroscience concept called the holographic universe about how we affect our world. And I see ourself as a sensor, that your eyes and your ears are sensors in themselves. I now show you um, a short extract of the film, the introduction, and then three players who did the experience and three of the potential narratives they have for calm, anger, and fear. No person gets one, each person gets one narrative, but you're going to see um, each one's after the other. This is a short video to illustrate for you the riot prototype and take you through the user experience complete with testimonials. The riot prototype is an emotionally responsive live action film with 3D immersive sound which uses the player's facial expressions to progress through a branching narrative to get through a riot alive. So this is the response for anger. Leave immediately. So if the facial recognition determines that you're angry, it will that will be your linear and film. Seeing that cop screaming and thinking that it could be my child, my black child, who one day may incite fear just because of the color of the skin, just got me so angry, and I guess it just registered. This would be the narrative for fear. It was scary to be shouted at, and which then led me to, well, be detained by the police officer, actually. The fact that that's how it is in a real situation. You react scared, and it escalates, and then you become pushed into a position where then suddenly you're criminalized or something. And this is calm. Not right now. situation I normally stay calm so even though there were distractions and things but for me my instinct is to go calmer and breathe and calm myself down. And then this other short film will show you a little bit about the design environment. Let me tell you why this is so great. 
This is just one room. It's less than 100 square feet. Mm -hmm. Yet we're able to use sensory and video, lights, the smells, the textures of this on the ground. It all brings you to the world and you're completely immersed. Even though we're not in a riot. You're in a riot right here. Not in a riot, in a riot. Riot oftentimes is destructive to the people who are fighting for justice. You know, because we were allowed to only do these things inside our own communities and the bricks into the world. Your hand started going oh, yeah. in and out like this, then your chest popped up, then the back yeah. of your neck just like just flicker. In like machine mode, like I will do anything to achieve my mission and protect my people. So it was both very powerful and vulnerable. Okay, then why don't I see what's what? I'm sorry, and then I can always come back for the second part. I just want to make sure. Me as well. I mean, either way. So what's happening is that people are becoming quite triggered and affected quite emotionally. And that's part of my responsibility as an artist in terms of I'm very intentful and conscious of the experiences I'm trying to create. Um, the aspects that influence my work are behavioral psychology, neuroscience, mindfulness, and parkour philosophy in terms of the concepts of moving through fear. My objective is to enable you to rewire your brain through going through the experience, become conscious of your subconscious behavior, and then go back into the experience and consciously change it. So in essence, reprogramming yourself. Um, traditionally, in your time, media is very much used to kind of trigger you. It's not something that you control. It's something which you're being constantly bombarded with images of anxiety or fear or tension or division. This work that I create is to learn to hone and master yourself so that you, the media is a reflector of your state of mind. So you trigger the media, the media doesn't trigger you. And then when you've learned that, you go back into your life and you're more unsusceptible to the media that's in, around you. I've worked with many amazing technolo technologists to create this work. I've worked with Brunel University London, who created the initial prototype, um, Dr. Hong Ying Meng and their computer science department. When I created the prototype two years ago, it wasn't even something which could be Googled. It was something just to create AI and film and linear film and branching narrative was just something that wasn't out there. So we've take, we took some time and developed a prototype. Then I had to go on another journey myself, and I had to travel to America, where I've worked with closely with TED as a, in their residency, and also ThoughtWorks, a technology company that has a strong social ethos. Sorry. Um, and with them, I continued, as with their residency, I was their AI artist in residence, and I continue to develop the system to make it um, develop it further, to develop on the emotions and make it multimodality. So, in the final, it, what we're currently developing, but in the final iteration, the, you'll be able to talk and respond to the characters in the film, and they'll be able to monitor your emotions via frequency and pitch, and also it'll be me measuring your pulse through measuring the capillaries under your eye, again through the webcam. And as I said, it's very important to create this imperceptible interface to kind of um, show how you, the, you affect your own reality is also invisible. While there I worked with their employees there, which they call thought workers, and we developed up the next version of Riot. Um, I, we, we developed up a facial expression recognition, which is all about your emotions. And here's a very short um, part of a film that we made in terms of we started to actually develop a neural network there. Hi, I'm Angelica Perez, and I'm the lead developer on Riot in the arts residency for ThoughtWorks. A data set is a collection of data samples that uh, come with classifications. We are creating a facial expression data set for Riot to create a neural net that can predict a facial expression emotions. Okay, so I, we made that film because um, it's very important to demystify this technology. 
Um, it's really important to get this technology uh, more accessible to the people. Uh, traditionally, your technology, particularly things like email and internet, always stayed with the regimes and the commercial companies and the military for several decades before it reached the people, and we don't want this to happen with AI. It's very important that voyagers like yourself get involved at the ground level. which takes us to bias and ethics. So as part of my, our research at ThoughtWorks, we looked at um, <laughs> um, bias and ethics, we researched in terms of bias. Now, in terms of when you're making an AI system, all AI is programmed by human beings. And all, I would go as far as to say, almost all or most are going to have some aspect of bias. So they're basically going to be programming that bias into the system. So it's almost impossible to create a system which is void of bias. Um, and there, that has been shown that there's been systems that's been created, um, AI systems that's supporting judges in terms of suggesting terms for criminals, and it has been proven to be biased towards people of color. Um, the companies that make these um, services are private corporations, and at the moment there's And there's, a few there's a few clusters of people who are coming together to create bodies to govern AI, but at the moment it's largely ungoverned in terms of policies. So this is something which is really important for um, me to not just be aware of, but also make you aware of through my work. So one way how that directly translates is that as part of my behavioral psychology research, I'm working with New York University Behavioral Psychology Department. And as part of their research into bias, they studied observers watching police dash cam footage of police brutality. And what they became aware of was that wherever the observer looked determined their bias. Because if they were empathetic towards the cop, they would be following the cop's narrative. If they were empathetic towards a person being brutalized, they would be following their perspective and their eye trajectory. And what they found is that people are often looking at completely different sides of the image and seeing completely different sides of the story. Um, so what I said to them was that if I could then direct people's eyes almost the opposite to the Benet clip I said you at the beginning, not manipulating but kind of guiding people to see the whole story, would they then potentially shift their perception? And they said, in theory, yes. Also what they said is that when people come in, they give them a questionnaire and they can tell from the questionnaire how biased or racist they are and that to directly confront them through talking to them, may they would become defensive. But through something as ambivalent as to say, oh, just look at that part of the screen, their brain will wire itself and they won't have to be defensive in any way. So I'm basically, that's one way I'm exploring, um, well, that's the approach I'm taking. One way I'm also exploring with the final riot that's currently in development is to potentially load the experience with bias. So I'm kind of saying there's all biases out there. So why don't I load it in there? So that you can select to play as a character And then, depending on the character you play, it will see your gender and your race, and it will then show you a narrative. Five minutes left, wow, wow, that's a nice, it's a very efficient piece of paper. Um, uh, wow, five minutes, okay, I'm moving a little bit quicker. Um, that they will load bias into the experience. Another way is that you could go through it, and at the end, it would, could tell you, oh, you are a white male, or you are a black woman, depending on your emotions, because it's load bias in there. I'm saying there's bias out there, I'm not trying to hide that, so I'm trying to draw people's attention. Um, I think, does that include the questions? No, okay, cool. Um, in terms of subconscious, I just want to, no, I'm gonna, I guess I'll tell you a story about, a very quick story about a lady I met regarding subconscious and changing behavior. I met a lady at the Armory show, I was showing my work in New York, and she got fear. Um, and I said to her at the first level, is that accurate? She said, yes, I tend to make myself smaller when I feel fearful. And I said, would you like to go through the experience again because it's about reprogramming yourself? And she said, no, not really, but I'm interested in reprogramming myself. I said, wow, that's really weird. Not many people is into that. Why are you into that? And she said, well, I'm never going to see you again. I'm in AA. 
and I'm looking at what's triggering me and um, trying to break those addictions. So we spoke some more, and then she goes, you know what, I'm going to actually go into the experience. So she went into the experience, and the second time, she got calm. And then the second level, because there's four levels, she got um, fear. And I said, did you feel the difference in yourself between the two levels? And she said, yes, I did. I felt that I was fighting against making myself smaller, and, but I couldn't hold on to it for the second level. I said, do you think that's something you could access in the future? She goes, she's going to try. So this is my objective of why I'm creating these media, is that I need media to empower you, not to um, reduce your power. Um, oh, going the wrong way. My name is... Um, so, I'm going to just touch on very quickly a possible future, is, and just go there briefly. Ready to engage. Okay, so this is a possible future. Um, otherwise, you're going to, it's not going to work out very well for many of you. Um, is with the Riot film, I've made a film and on the back has got an AI system. My objective is to take off the film and to give you the AI so that you have a mobile AI that the people can use, which is open source for use as you will. Um, and this gentleman gave some analogy to what I was going to do, that people in terms of ethics have said, well, if you're going to give it out there, maybe people are going to use it for bad things. And my developer said the same thing. It's like a knife. A knife can be used to save someone's life if you're a surgeon, or it can be used to kill them. And my objective is that I feel a little bit safer, in fact, a lot safer, to get it in the hands of people than in the hands of who it may be in at the moment. Um, just and further frontiers. As I said, I'm working with the SPAM lab in um, behavioral psychology in New York. It's a lab that focuses on motivations, emotions, needs, and goals of people, and how they hold impact the basic ways people perceive, interpret, and ultimately react to the information around them. And as well as them, I'm working with the um, Immersive Storytelling Studio in London, who are part of my filmmaking team to develop the production. The final right iteration, my developing objectives, which are kind of counter to each other, so I'm still developing them both up, is to make people aware of their subconscious behavior and also shift people's perception and bias, explore issues of race and social justice, because in the time we're living, I'm trying to create some deeper understanding through what your portals of media are currently providing you with. Um, also, as you saw, the lady was quite um, upset, is that I create an emotional decompression environment to create a form of transformation to encourage people to move through fear and develop that into a storytelling 360 film. So what that will look like is that you will move into a room maybe half this size and you will stand in the space and you will be surrounded by a film. It will be completely dark, it'll be a 360 film and then you'll hear the sound with ambisonic sound of a petrol bomb going over your head. The whole, screen, the whole room would light up all around you and a riot cop will run towards you and say, get out of here. A citizen will run towards you and say, help me, help me, my shop's on fire. Another activist will run towards you and say, come with us if you want to find out the truth. And depending on your eye tracking, that will determine the narrative you will follow. So that's where I'm at and that's why I've come back to talk to you about your future. And my only last thing to say is thank you, Voyagers, and please join be part of this movement so this technology can be something which we can all be a part of. Thank you. All right, are there any questions for Karen Palmer? They're all so shy. Hi, my name's Robert. So if I understood you correctly, this could be used as a sort of social biofeedback teaching tool yeah, for any be, kind of situation? It could be used for any situation. Dep people, different people with different backgrounds say, oh, you could use this for empathy training, you could use this for training the police, you could use this for people who have um, autism. 
it's basically a barometer for you in any way which you could use for, I would say, positive outcomes. Or you could teach yourself to lie convincingly. Um, you could, but you may already, if you're that way inclined, you may have already <laughs> perfected that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for this nice presentation. Um, I'm very interested in the phenomenon of the immer immersion, and I wondered how much immersion depends on technology or on the storytelling side. So would it also be possible with, little, uh, with less technology? And can you tell a little more about immersion? Um, so the craft of story is the kind of engine of the piece. Um, I came up with the concept of how you think you may respond in the right situation would not, may not be how you think you would, and that would reveal. So then I went through the technology. What could do that? I'm a creative and a filmmaker first, but I use tech, but I don't pick up the tech at the beginning. I don't go, oh, lovely VR, what can I do? I go, what's my story? So to reveal back to you who you are, it had to be imperceptible. And then also to enhance this concept of how you affect your world, I just didn't want any technology on you. I wanted you to walk out the space and then be aware that, oh, maybe if my boss is shouting at me, maybe if I respond differently, I'll get a different reaction. But the story is paramount, and I'm now like interviewing more people that have been in riots to decide what the narratives will be. And maybe I'm going to go in with different narratives, like you'll go in from the perspective of a riot cop's camera, and then maybe a CCTV footage from a, someone's shop, maybe someone's mobile, so that you'll see that there's not one perception of any one story. Does that answer your question? Hi. Um, I was wondering um, what happens if you um, stay calm in a riot and still get beaten up? This oh, is what happens, yes. like, I think a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. And so. your system suggests that we are all the same in a way, mm -hmm. but what about psychopaths? Okay. They are not pathologically ill, mm -hmm. but they are, so to speak, the, the other. Mm -hmm. How would they deal with the system okay. of yours? Okay, so the first question is a very good question. And my objective of the prototype was to feed back to you how you would respond in a situation. Then I started researching. I didn't get into issues particularly of race and color because it was just to show proof of concept. Then when I looked deeper and started to investigate, I had conversations with behavioral psychologists who said, what about the black guy that died life on Facebook? He was very calm and he still died. And I said, this is the limitations of reality and how much you can control it. So this is something which I'm currently exploring because it doesn't answer those questions. So this is a big part of my next level of investigation for your first part, 100% I agree. Um, the second part, it, it, we're all different. Also in terms of culturally, we're different as well. So I'm showing with the facial recognition your external emotion, but the pulse under your eye will show your internal emotion and your internal state of being. I can't comment on, I think psychopaths might also be cool inside, but um, a psychopath is, I don't know, that may, I'm not sure how to comment on how it would, but in terms of showing ex more states of mind than what you're projecting, the next version for exactly that reason, that some people were like, I'm very calm on the outside, but inside I'm an emotional wreck. That's why the next version is going to monitor people's pulse, but through their um, capillaries under their eye. Okay, we have time for one last question. Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I think it's like a game, but I, my really question is, what is with animals? Um, we, we people think uh, we, we, what the other can say or we can say, but but what is with my dog? Like, uh, what ha for feelings have she or he? Uh, they can impressive be or for, for the dog, but. If I won't feel like my dog, uh, I want I understood my dog. What what he like? Uh, what 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 he, what he like to do or what he don't like to do and why? So for other perspective of the animals, can it help in the future? Is your question: Can it show perspective of animals? Yes. Um, 
that wasn't the objective, um, but there's so much more potential beyond what I'm doing, and that's why I want to make the AI um, accessible to everybody, because I have a certain agenda um, and objective, and there's things that you will put, if that's your passion, um, and that if we made the AI, when we made the AI open source, that's something which you can pursue, because I think that's quite a unique approach. So that's something, we, I think in theory, there's potential in terms of what it can do. So yeah, I'll, when the open source is available, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Karen thank you. Palmer. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.